الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters I trust you guys are fantastic and well I need you to pay very close attention to everything that I have to say because والله this may just be the most important and beneficial video I have made Ever in my entire life Alhamdulillah, I made some beneficial videos Because I'm down, man You know, them things there But yeah, back to more serious issues We've been getting several emails from brothers and sisters Who are telling us that they don't feel that connection with Allah in their salah In their namaz or their prayer We're going to say salah because that's the way we should Call it the salah, right? And they don't feel that connection And they don't feel that khushu And they don't want to pray Sometimes they abandon their prayer People message us all the time They got problems in their life Today we got a message specifically from a sister Who's saying that she feels really lonely Alone, she's living out on her own She's 18 years old Family issues in Germany She has to live alone, right? She's got health issues, family issues No connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prayer And at the same time Like it just feels alone all these issues, whether you've got issue related to, you know, not being able to control your desires, you're sad, you're depressed, you're lonely, just unhappy. The solution to every single thing is the salah, is the prayer. That is the solution to everything. Because if you fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, suddenly he makes everything easy for you. But the reality is that me and you, we pray. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين. but we still look at women. well الحمد لله I don't clap. شالوا ما جيز. الحمد لله. but people still look at women. you still do zina. but Allah said in the Quran in Surah Al-Kabut that undoubtedly the prayer, without a shadow of a doubt, it prevents you from filthy acts like zina and pornography and all these kind of things. Allah tells you ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب that undoubtedly, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest and ease and peace. But I'm remembering Allah all the time. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. But my heart's not feeling easy. And in the prayer, I'm making these prayers to Allah. And I've been told that I should feel this presence. Uh, not, not this presence, but I should feel this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I just don't feel that. And my prayer is empty and that just doesn't even want to make you pray. And then eventually what happens is that prayer just becomes robotic. Brothers and sisters. The Prophet ﷺ was one man who suffered more than anyone in this world. The Prophet ﷺ said that there is no one who suffered for this religion before me or after me more than I have. There will not be anyone, there has not been anyone. I am the one who suffered the most. You look at his life, you will cry. You will shed tears. Just by reading about the pain and the suffering this man Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went through for the sake of Allah His beloved wife died As a result of the embargo the Quraysh put on him He had to witness One of his beloved companions Sumayya radiyallahu anha Being murdered in cold blood in front of his eyes By having a spear stabbing her in her Private parts. He had to witness these things, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A sword struck him on his head, and two metal bits of the chainmail from the armor on his head embedded themselves in his forehead. And the only way to remove them was for another companion, Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah radiallahu anhu, who came and literally had to put his teeth around those links and pull them out. And imagine the pain process in him because Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah and when he did that, his tooth fell out. Two chain mills, two tooth lost, two teeth lost. That was the pain that he saw us and went through. But he would say that the coolness of my eyes, the thing that relieves my stress and brings me happiness and ease is the salah. Did anyone perfect their salah like him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. 
That's why no one was happier than him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why the companions, radiyallahu anhum ajma'in, who noticed everything that he did to the point where they knew how many hairs were left that were gray in his beard when he died, they knew the exact number. They also noted one thing, very obvious, that we never saw him except that he was smiling, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The prayer was a direct result of that. So no matter where you are, what problem you're going through, no matter who's not in your life and who hurt you, if your salah is on point, you're on point. Your life is on point. You know in the Adhan we hear, Hayya ala salah. The translation is, rush to the salah. But the term hay, hayya ala salah. Hay comes from the word hay, meaning life. So the way to really understand the, most, the more accurate translation would be base your life upon the salah. Because if you base your life upon the salah, your life is calm. Your life is perfect. So brothers and sisters, let's dive straight into it. I want to share with you three things that will enable you to pray like you have never prayed before. Wallahi, I'm telling you, if you implement what I tell you today and you have not previously done all the things I tell you and you do them today, you know what you will feel? Like you have never prayed before in your life. You, will, you might actually just pray for the very first time. You might actually feel that sweetness of Iman for the very first time. If he dumped you, it's okay. If she broke up with you, it's okay. If your mom and dad beat you, wrong, it's not okay. But the point is that the pain will go. Whatever your problem is, whatever your suffering is, whatever your disease or illness is, you will not feed it. Wallahi. So let's begin. The first thing that I want to touch upon is the wudu. You see, sometimes we dive straight into the prayer. And I want you to bear, bear with me. Please watch all day through the end. I promise you, I'm sharing things with you. Even though it sounds like you heard it, you've never heard what I'm going to share with you before. Unless you're a G like that, inshallah. But alhamdulillah. You're probably not as G as me, so keep listening. No, I'm not being arrogant, I'm just being funny. Okay, so shout out. The point is this. That when you go to exercise, do you not warm up your muscles and prepare yourself for the exercise? The same way there are some pre-prayer things that we need to do. There are some pre-salah things that me and you need to do before we actually pray. Some of which are obligatory, some of which are not. But if you do them, you put yourself into the mindset of prayer. Research has shown that any task that you do, this is psychological research, any task that you do, whether it's playing football, whether it's reading or memorizing Quran or studying in your exams or praying the salah, 80% of the success is to do with your psychological mindset. Only 20% is to do with the actual task itself. So number three, the third point is going to be the task itself. But the first two points I'm going to share with you are going to help your psychology. That's 80% of the success. 80% of the success in your salah is your mind. Do you hear me? That's what research has shown. The wudu is a thing that is what some scholars say the key to the prayer. If you have not made wudu, your prayer is not going to be accepted. But sometimes we think going to wudu, do wudu at the sink is like, just splash a bit of water on your face. Some of us do it as quick as we possibly can. Some of us don't even wash our feet properly. When Musa our heels, bearing in mind, Prophet said that save your heels from the hellfire when he saw the companions were missing out some of their heels when they were making wudu and so on and so forth. Let's discuss the wudu and what the wudu can do for us and have khushu and focus and that connection with Allah in our prayer. We've all heard the hadith many times that cleanliness is half of our iman. Iman meaning our belief. Cleanliness is half of our iman. Not deen, not the hadith about half your Oh, marriage is half your deen Spouse is half your deen Cleanliness is half of iman Let's go to the Arabic When things are translated, they're translated poorly Of course the translator does as best as he or she possibly can But let's be honest, it's not perfect so Let's go to the Arabic At-tahur shaturul iman The Prophet said At-tahur shaturul is half of iman The word tahur What is tahur? Tahur comes from what? Tahara. It is Tahara. Cleanliness. But see, in a shari, in a religious sense, what is Tahara? Wudu. 
In the Islamic sense, the word cleanliness, the word tahara is linked to wudu. It's related to wudu. The way to do tahara is for you to do wudu. It's for you to do ghusl. So the more accurate translation of this hadith, at-tahuru shatrul iman, is ha- wudu is half of iman. That's quite deep when you look at it. A simple act of splashing water on our faces is no longer a simple act of splashing water on our faces, is it? Suddenly it's half of the religion. But why? Why on earth would wudu be half of our iman? Why? We're going to discuss that in a second and this will bring to light the reality of what the wudu is. But before I do that, you need to understand if wudu is half of iman, what is the other half? Logically speaking. The salah. So the first half is wudu, the second half is salah. We... I've been trying to get perfection in the second half without having built up the first half. Do you see the problem? Do you see why wudu is necessary for me and you to do wudu properly? It's necessary for us to do that. Yeah? Build the first half for the second. You can't build a house until the foundation is built. Wudu, we start there. So then what are some of the benefits of wudu? Now when you go to make wudu, I don't want it to be a simple action of, because we don't have khushu in our wudu either. It's just, you know, making wudu. Now you're going to feel the wudu. You're going to live with the wudu. The Prophet said in an authentic narration, a hadith sahih, he said that when a person goes to make wudu, when a person intends to make wudu and goes to his water bucket, in our terms, a sink, and the person washes his hands, which is the beginning of the wudu, from when the first drop of water falls, that person's sins are washed away. From the hands. You slap someone, you stole something small, not big, something small, Maybe like a lollipop from here and there. Maybe you did something wrong with your hand. It's gone. It's washed away. All of them. Then when the person takes the water and puts, them in, puts it in his mouth, from when the first drop of water touches the floor, when it's spat out and exposed, the person's sins from the person's mouth are washed away. Maybe you did a bit, said a few wrong, wrong things, a few bad things. It's gone. Can you imagine when you're washing your mouth? It's it's cleaning you. Then when a person, going on further, washes their face, after the nose of course, the sins of the ears and the sins of the eyes are gone. Washed away. Then the person will continue to wash his limbs, his arms, the mess over the head, until the sins are consistently being washed away. And then when the person washes the feet and finishes the wudu at the end, the person is clean as if the day his mother gave birth to him. The words of the Prophet said, just by doing wudu. And then the person will go and pray salah and Allah will continue to increase his ranks even higher and higher. Now, disclaimer, this refers to the minor sins. If you do zina and murder, you need to make serious repentance. You need to be expiated of those sins. This is referring to what we call the kabair. The major sins, the minor sins, i.e. you said a rude word here, you did this here, you said that here, zina of the eyes, i.e. you looked at something you shouldn't have looked at, you were looking at that girl you shouldn't, it's all gone, it's clear. Brother, your, your sins are being washed away just by doing that. Imagine that now, that process, actually those bad and rude words you said, see them falling out of your mouth. The power of wudu. Let's go on, let's progress. The Prophet said says something very interesting. And this is perhaps the most important hadith I'm going to share with you about wudu. The Prophet explains that obviously on the Day of Judgment, we will be, we will be uh, where we did wudu, these areas will be shining. The areas where we did wudu, those places on our body will be shining. He described it in the following way. He said they will, that, that we will, the believers will be غُرًا muhajjalin. Let me explain to you what this means. And this will be from the wudu. From the effects of the wudu, we will be ghurran muhajjaleen. Right? Ghurran, for the, it's, it's a term that you use to describe horses. So, a horse that has a beautiful white streak running through its forehead is ghurran. A horse that has that streak running through its head all the way through its limbs and its body, its back and its arms is muhajjaleen. Ghurran muhajjaleen. Now, Think about it, you see a bland horse, like a white horse, or a black horse, or a brown horse. It's just, it's, it's a nice color, but it's bland. Suddenly when you see that beautiful, majestic streak, you're like, that's a horse built for a king. And that is what makes the horse more valuable. So Prophet is saying that on the Day of Judgment, we will look, we, he describes us as valuable horses, ghurran muhajjaleen. When everyone else in mankind will be the normal skin color, black, brown, pink, white, 
purple, green, whatever color you are, bruv. That's your color. But the believers will be ghurran muhajjaleen. Like these beautiful, majestic horses. And this nur just emanating from our faces all over our body that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bestow upon us. Imagine that. But then we go on and we understand the hadith in context. I wanted to explain to you this word first so you understand the magnitude and the massiveness of the hadith to come. The Prophet was sitting with his companions and we all know this hadith but we don't know the rest of it. He was sitting there and he began to be very upset and cry. And the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, why are you upset? He said, I long to meet and see my brothers. I long to meet and see my brothers, my extension sisters, right? Because the, the, the masculine is the universal term in the Arabic language. So he means us, those, you know, his brothers and sisters, right? And the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, are we not your brothers? And the person said, La, you are my ashab. You are my companions. My brothers are those who will come and they have not seen me, but they will accept me as their prophet and accept Allah as their master. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the companion's like, Ra. Okay, well, we, we need to find out a bit more about these people. They said, Ya Rasulullah, how will you notice them and recognize them if you have never seen them? And look what the Prophet said. He said, if a man had a whole batch of horses that are ghurran muhajjaleen, and bear in mind, one out of every 1,000 horses would be ghurran and muhajjaleen. Yeah? He said, if you had a batch of horses that were ghurran muhajjaleen, like millions and millions of them, but then these horses now got mixed up with all the other normal horses. So these majestic, beautiful horses that stand out got mixed up with all these other horses. The Prophet said, would you not be able to differentiate between your ghurran muhajjaleen horses and the normal horses? They said, of course. He said that my ummah, my brothers will come, us inshallah, those who accepted him without having seen him, will come to him on the day of judgment. And while everyone is in turmoil, screaming, running for their life, he will recognize as ghurran muhajjadeen from the effects of perfecting the wudu. But for instance, you have to understand that everyone must go through, before they go through Jannah, must drink from the hands of the Prophet Sallam. The haud, the pond outside. They must drink from that. From, from, from the fountain, so they must drink from that. The only way you're going to get in is if you do that. The only way he, Sallallahu Alaihi is going to recognize you is through the effects of wudu. Now imagine you make wudu with this. Imagine that act of this is now an act of purification. And it's an act of shining. So then when you wash your hands, the sins fell and suddenly the hand is glowing. You should be visualizing this. And on that day, you'll be recognized through this act that seems mediocre and trivial to you. Look at the effects of it on that day. Now put aside the facts that we will be noticed to enter Jannah through this. But after you make wudu, the Prophet ﷺ told us to make a du'a. He said, if someone perfects their wudu, he does their wudu properly, slowly, calmly, relaxed, do it properly. And then the person goes and makes this du'a after. Allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahirin. Oh Allah, make me from amongst those who do tawbah and come back to you and make me from amongst those who are pure. I mean, do you know what happens, the Prophet said? Wallahi, this is the speech of him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he said it, it is true, it is haq, it happens. It happens. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that once you read that dua, all the gates of Jannah open for you. Forget the day of judgment for a second. Right here, right now, on this earth, the gates of Jannah fling open for you, all of them. That is how beloved wudu is to Jannah. It's like it's literally calling you, just by you and me making wudu. This is preparing you for the prayer to come. We haven't even got to the salah yet. So now you've done your wudu. Now, point number two. Mental preparation. You know, they say, if you dress good, you feel good, right? If you dress good, you feel good. You're about to stand in front of the master of the heavens and the earth and have a conversation with him. And me and you are praying Fajr in our pajamas. We're praying 
in clothes that we would wear if we were washing the house, painting, like our rough clothes. If I tell you go out to meet the axe or you go out to link that chick which you shouldn't be, man spraying cologne over himself, fresh gums, and um, But what about when you go to meet Allah? My beloved brothers and sisters, take out your nice robe, your nice abaya, take out your nice clothes, make sure they're ironed. This is Allah you're going to meet. Mentally prepare yourself, feel good. Put the utter, that beautiful utter, that perfume on your body, smell good, feel good. You just make wudu. You're about to have a conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You come to the prayer mat and you raise your hands, but you don't say takbir yet. Wait, put the hands back down. There's one more thing that I need for you to do. I need you to visualize. You see, the brain cannot tell the difference between what's real and what's not. So if you can imagine something to be true, the brain will believe it's true. Let me tell you a story of one man. His name was Ibn Abi Hatim, rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy on him. He was a man from amongst the pious predecessors who was known for his prayer. Like, you know, people are known for things. Some people are known for their memory. Some people are known for their Quranic recitation. Some people are known for their knowledge of hadith. This sheikh, this alim, was specifically known for his prayer. He, his prayer was just sick. His prayer was the bang bang. That was his prayer. So when the people went and met him, they said, we want to ask you, like, how is your prayer so sick? Like, what do you do? He said, every time before I pray, I spend about a minute or two doing the following visual exercise. Visual exercise. He says, what I imagine is I imagine that I, the day of judgment is here and I am standing at the sirat. You know the sirat, which is that bridge that is thinner than a hair but sharper than a blade? You have to get to paradise on the other side. Thinner than a hair, sharper than a blade. He says that I'm standing right at the edge and the sirat is in front of me. Like I'm here and the sirat is there. And he goes, I set the stage for myself. So I see that. And he goes, and then, you know, there are hooks on the sirat. And the first hook will be for those who didn't pray, for, whose prayer was messed up and deficient. The hook will grab them and throw them into the fire. He says, I imagine I see the first hook. I see people falling off the sirat and going into the hellfire. They're so close to Jannah, but they fall. That's the first thing I visualize and I see. He says, then... I put the angel of death behind me. He's waiting for me. I imagine that the moment I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, <gasps> I'm also God. I imagine that the moment this is the last prayer, the moment I finish, he's there, he's taken me. And I have to walk. Then I place Jannah on my right with all its wonders. And Jahannam on my left with all of its terrors. And I placed the Prophet ﷺ watching above me, watching if I pray my prayer correctly. You know, when someone walks into the room, suddenly the prayer goes slow. He says, I imagine the Prophet ﷺ watching over me. Like he's there, so I'm gonna pray properly. Muhammad Rasulullah is watching. When he goes through this mental exercise, Wallahi, when I, when, I, when I went through this the first time, I was like, SubhanAllah, my prayer changed. You want khushu? Do this exercise. You've just made wudu. You've been thinking about day of judgment, everything. You're calm, you're relaxed, you're mentally there. And now you're focused for the prayer. You know why this exercise is so important, brothers and sisters? Because sometimes, me and you are working, we're working, we're working, it's salah time, and then we go straight to salah. You were just thinking about your work, your essay that you had to hand in, you are talking about, thinking about that conversation you were just having with your mom, your dad, your wife, whoever, and then you go pray? Well, obviously you're going to be thinking about that rubbish when you're praying because that's what you were just thinking about. You need to have a moment to disconnect from the dunya and connect to Allah before the prayer begins. What do you think? Allah, Akbar, magically everything's going to go out of your head? No, you need to empty out your mind and by performing this visual exercise, you do that. You see what I'm saying? And then once you've done that, we come to the third point. You're going to pray, but now we're going to discuss the meaning of the prayer. What on earth are you saying? So we begin. So take notes. With the takbir. Allahu Akbar. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Allah is the greatest. 
لا it doesn't mean Allah is the greatest الله أكبر Allah is great Allah is great this is the highest form not Allah is great test he is great so every time you become distracted in the prayer you start thinking about that girl you start thinking about that guy you start thinking about that movie you start thinking about what you got to do tomorrow suddenly you remember whenever you say Allahu Akbar think how many times before you go to ruku you say Allahu Akbar you, your mind faded but when you say Allahu Akbar you said Allah is greater and then you remember Allah is greater than that girl I'm thinking of Allah is greater than that boy who dumped me. Allah is greater than my family. Even though my family is important, Allah is greater than all of them. Let me focus. I'm standing before my master right now. Allahu Akbar. Imagine how empowering that is. Every time you move in the prayer, you say Allahu Akbar. 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 Every time you move. So at any point, if you get distracted and you say Allahu Akbar, you remind yourself of his greatness. That he is greater than anything. That's who you stand in front of. You see that the prayer has a mechanism in itself to pull you back. Your distraction, shaitan takes you away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pulls you right back. Allahu Akbar. Then you can say some supplications. Then let's go to the Fatiha. Because the Prophet said the prayer is basically the Fatiha. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Rahman Rahim Maliki Umideen etc. This is the crux of the prayer. And if your Fatiha is messed up, then you have not prayed. But before you begin the Fatiha, what do we say? A'udhu billahi minash shaytan rajim We seek refuge in Allah. A'udhu. But what on earth does A'udhu mean? Does it mean I seek refuge in Allah? What does refuge even mean? We don't know what refuge means. We don't want to speak Shakespeare. A'udhu. The way the scholars describe what this means linguistically, it's like, you know when you see a, uh, when you see a baby like deer or baby gazelle, the way it holds on to its mum? Like when a mom holds on to her baby child like that, protection. But we're not seeking protection from our mothers right now. May Allah bless them. Billah. Want Allah to protect us. From who? Min. From who? Shaytan. Shaytan who? Min Rajim. Rajim, what does Rajim mean? Shaytan, the piece of trash. The accursed, what does accursed mean? Rajim, Rajim is used to describe something being tossed away like it's a piece of trash. Allah, I want you to protect me from that shaitan, a piece of trash. You know how important it is to start with that? Because the Prophet told us that in our prayer, there is a shaitan ascribed specifically to come and basically distract our prayer. Specific. He's trained. He's been trained for 1,434 years to specifically distract Muslims in the salah. He's able to distract the most knowledgeable, greatest, most pious. Well, of course, actually, he can't really get to them, to be honest, but he's been doing it for a while, yeah? And what does he do? You know when you get, like, really amazing ideas in your prayer? I like, you know, it says that you just came up with like the, the answer and the solution to cancer and world poverty. That's him. It's like one sheikh explained, he comes with a briefcase. It's like he's got a suit, tie on everything. He comes to the prayer. He opens up his briefcase and he's got these fantastic ideas and he starts giving them to you. And suddenly before you know it, like what happened to Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen? You're thinking about, yeah, that's what I'm going to get. Then she's going to love me for real. That's that shaitan. And you ask protection from him before you start because he comes to you. And also the Prophet said, if you, if you feel that waswasa, that whispering of him come again, then what you say is, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Allah, protect me from that shaitan piece of trash. And then spit dryly over your head this way. Left shoulder, left shoulder. Not spit, don't spit on the brother next to you fam, but dryly. Spit dryly. And I am telling you, watch, you will be able to concentrate again. Okay, so now it gets exciting. Now it gets exciting. We start with the Fatiha. One second, let me get comfortable. The first ayah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What do we say? All praise and all thanks always is and was and belongs to Allah, Master of the Worlds. 
at this time, I want you to understand that you're thanking Allah for everything he's done for you. You're thanking him for your mom. You're thanking him for your wife. You're thanking him for the ability to go to the toilet and actually release your filth. There are people who need to go to the toilet to have that happen to them. You're making dua, you're thanking Allah for the wealth that he gave you. You're thanking him for the, for the fact he made you Muslim. So you should be, your mind should come to these things that you're grateful for right now. Think about it. And on the flip side, Allah says in the Quran, if you do shukr to me, if you, if you thank me, I'm going to give you more. So inside the very first ayah, when you praise and thank Allah, is the formula for having more of what he's already given you. Brothers and sisters, you can go to the school of pain or you can go to the school of happiness. The school of pain happens when we don't thank Allah, then Allah has to punish us and inflict us with hardship so we can remember him again. The school of happiness on the flip side, Allah doesn't need to punish you because you're always remembering him. Because you don't forget him and you're thanking him for what he's given you. And because he, you're thanking him in Surah Al-Ibrahim, Allah says, I will give you more if you thank me. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise and thanks is to you, Master of the Universe. Master of all sentient beings with intelligence. Pause. The Prophet said in a hadith Qudsi, a hadith Qudsi is a hadith where he is repeating what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said himself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that when my, when my slave says the Fatiha, I respond to him. I have a conversation with him. When my slave says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, I respond. So we just said, thank you, all praise and thanks is to you, Allah. Allah responds. He says, Hamadani Abdi. Allah says, my slave has praised and thanked me. I want you to understand this. You know when a child goes to school, like a young child, and he goes to art lesson and he draws a picture and he comes back home. He's like, mom, 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 look. I drew you, me, mom, dad, and the pet cat. And that looks like, that picture looks like, it's like, ugh. That does not look like me. If you show it to another person, that person might think, I, I think your kid needs help. <laughs> that, that's what your kid makes. I think you need to, to help your kid. Yeah? But to the parent, that picture means everything. What's the parent going to do with that picture? The parent's going to take that picture and put it in the refrigerator. And then anyone who comes to the house, that parent's going to be like, look at that. And the person will be like, Ugh, like yeah, look at that. Why the heck? Why, why is that? On your fridge for you should burn the fridge and the picture that's how ugly that looks but you're like my with pride with honor with this feeling of like wow you're like my son my daughter made that for me that's your parent and how excited your parent gets over your really crap drawing now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present with his angels around him. And the angels are listening. And our prayer is like weak. We don't concentrate. It's deficient. We're not worthy of even speaking to Allah. But we say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. It's like this picture that we brought. And then Allah's response. Look how he shows us up to the angels. Hamadani Abdi. My slave has praised and thanked me. Allah is showing us off to the angels like that parent shows off that picture. My, 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 my daughter made that for me. Allah says, my slave has praised me. No matter how deficient and weak and not deserving our prayer and our praise and our thanks is. Let's proceed. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Allah, you're the most merciful. The one who consistently sends his mercy, the abundant mercy. Now, how do we understand Allah's mercy? Let me put it to you this way. You know in the previous ayah, you just thanked Allah for some stuff? You just thanked Him, right? Let me ask you something. Let's take your mom, for example. Let's take your mom. And let's take your lungs. Your mom and your lungs, two examples. You thanked Allah for your mom and your lungs in the previous ayah, but did you deserve those lungs? Okay, my dad 
says to me, if I get really good grades, I'm going to buy you a car. He didn't, of course. But I'm just saying. So he says, if you get good grades, I'll buy you a car. And if I work really hard and I work every day, you could say I deserve a car because I did something. But did me and you deserve anything to have a mum? Did we deserve anything to have a set of lungs that function? Like when you were inside the womb of your mother, were you like some super fetus, some super embryo that you, it was your huck, it was your right, it was obligatory upon Allah to give you a mum? No. We didn't deserve anything. But he gave it to us anyway. Why would he give us something that we don't deserve? Because of his mercy. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. You're like, I don't even deserve this. And my thanks can never do justice. But you gave it to me anyway. Then Allah responds again. Now he says, my slave has praised me again and again. My, my slave just keeps praising me. You praised him twice. But Allah's like, my slave's just going on. He just, he just won't stop. Look, there's not once my slave just carries on praising me. In front of the angels. And then we say, Maliki Yawmiddi. Owner, master, controller of the day of judgment. Now you're remembering Okay, so he gave me these things that I didn't deserve But he's going to expect me To tell him what I did with them on the day of judgment You know, everything that he gives you Subhanahu wa ta'ala He will ask you well, Okay, I gave it to you, you didn't deserve it But what did you do with it? I gave you lungs, you smoked them away? You smoked your lungs away, really? I gave you a brain that functions properly and you just drunk alcohol and killed your brain cells? I gave your mom to care for you and you, you talk back to her? I gave you a brain that works but you didn't even work hard in school? I gave you the ability to read Quran and you just left your Quran there? I gave you Islam and then you went into Jahiliya and you went to the clubs? I made you into a respectable woman, a, 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 you know, a honor, prestige, this, this woman, this queen. Would you open your legs for that guy to treat you like a piece of rubbish and meat and take your honor and dignity away? That's what you did with the honor I gave you? You're like, hold up. These things that I'm thanking Allah for that he gave me, I didn't deserve. I'm going to have to answer for them. Then Allah responds, he says something again. It's like Allah's like, look, look, look what Allah is saying. He's like, my slave praise me. My slave just carried on praising me, praising me, praising me. Now Allah is like, Psh. that right there, my slave said, he, my slave just handed himself over to me. It's like, like, what else can we say? Allah's like, my slave has now honored me, exalted me so much, glorified me so much. It's like my slave has just submitted to me and given into the fact that I'm in charge. That's it. Like, my slave has just done it. Like, that, that's subhanAllah. Well, it was that easy. Allah is satisfied with us. Three ayat, three ayat Allah satisfied. And you're having this conversation, you're feeling this divine conversation between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you. And then suddenly what do you say? It is you and only you that we worship. I don't worship my girl. I don't worship my money. They don't come before me. If I have to choose linking this girl who's haram anyway or praying, will I choose her? I choose Allah. Will I choose that money? Will I choose Allah? Will I choose my friends? Will I choose Allah? You're the only object of my desire and obedience. You, Allah. We proclaim that. And it is only you that we ask for help. Now in the Arabic there are two words for help. There's the word Nasr. Nasr means help. I'm dying. I need your help right now. He's going to kill me. Help. I need Nusr. I need help. Then there's Aun. Nasta'in comes from Aun. Aun means can I have assistance? You're not saying I need urgent help. You're saying can I have 
a hand. Bro, can you can you pass me my phone? Can I have your assistance to pass me my phone? Akhi, can you can you pass me the salt? Akhi, I'm just having a bit of trouble with this understanding this hadith. Can you give me a helping hand? Assistance. Why do we say this in the Fatiha? Why? Because of course, in times of difficulty, in times of extreme and dire need, everyone's like, Allah help. She left me Allah. Help. Ya Allah, my mom and dad. They're always fighting, Ya Allah help. In times of heart, difficulty, you always remember. But in those everyday, little day-to-day -day tasks, we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you, you need his assistance for everything. The Prophet said that even if you lose your shoelace, you should make the eye, because if Allah doesn't will for it, you won't get it back. Even something as simple as replacing a shoelace, you need his assistance. Now, a little bit of a technical linguistic feature I want to point out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَنَسْتَعِينَ Only you do we worship and you do we... Uh, it is only you that we worship and ask for assistance. But Allah said, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ إِيَّاكَ is mentioned twice. إِيَّاكَ means only you. Why did Allah do that? When it would have made perfect sense to say, but he separates you. Because you see, when you look at it separates the two and makes them distinct sentences. And we learned that before you ask for assistance, really, we should be doing something for Allah. Before you ask, worship Him. If you worship Him, if you do the na'budu, then you can ask for the nasta'in. Make sense? But then there may be some of us who have never done any of the na'budu. We haven't prayed for a very long time. And we've sinned, sin upon sin upon sin. And we have transgressed against ourselves. And we have disobeyed Allah. And we have hurt many people. And we've been hurt in the process. And we're very lonely and far away from the religion right now. And we don't feel that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really we don't deserve to ask for anything. But Allah separated the two by making them distinct sentences. As if to say, this is a sentence on its own, worship me. And you know what, if you haven't worshipped me, you can still ask for help. What is dying? Allah's doors are still open to that person who didn't even worship him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like he's still willing to help you. He made them two distinct separate sentences so you could treat that as a sentence on its own and take that benefit. We say that we don't feel that connection with Allah in our prayer. You have to understand one thing. As long as you are praying, you are knocking on Allah's door. Don't ever think that Allah won't let you in. But He wants to see you knock. He wants to see you try. So carry on knocking. When we say it's clear that we need some help and we're going to ask for help and we're going to ask for help in the next ayah. So Allah says something and what does He say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically asks us what we want. Notice that first Allah is saying something and He's speaking in the third person, bigging us up to the angels. But now Allah speaks to us directly. He goes from Third person to second person. Second person is more personal, it's more close. So why that's, that's why the change of tense happens. So now Allah speaking to me and you directly. So what do you want? You praise me. You've made me really happy right now. Hamadani Abdi, my slave has praised me. If, I, if there was a time I was going to give you something, it's now. What is the greatest thing we can ask for? Guide us upon the straight path. Brothers and sisters, guidance is the most important thing we can ask for. If you want to find a good wife, you need guidance. If you want to get a good job, you need guidance. But ultimately, you want to get to paradise. You want to be happy, you, want, you don't want to be lonely. You need guidance. Guide us to the Sirat al-Mustaqim.
that straight path. Allah literally take me there. Take me there. Sirat al al-amta alayhim. The path of those who earned your favor. The part of those who you looked upon them and said they deserve me to give them stuff. The path of Muhammad Sallallahu the path of Ibn Taymiyyah, the path of Salahuddin Ayyubi, the path of the scholars, the righteous, the path of these great men and women. That path. The path of Dan Baba. Because even though he's a sick football player, mashallah, he prays in my masjid, by the way. I've seen him with my own eyes. Front row of the masjid, every Fajr prayer, every Isha prayer, Juma prayer. With the amount of money he makes, I would say Alhamdulillah, and the fact that he prays, we can maybe, Allah knows best what's in the heart, but we can say, he's from amongst those, Alladheena and Amta Alayhim. And Allah's favor. So Allah, make us like them, Baba. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ yeah, but not the path of those who will be the recipient of your rage. Not, sorry, not your rage, the rage. غير المغضوب Those who will be the recipients of rage, because it won't just be Allah that's angry on that day, the angels will be angry on that day, the, mu- the insan will be angry on that day, the, the, sh- the jinn will be angry on that day, Jahannam will be angry on that day. This person is just going to get ambushed by anger from all over. غير المقضوب not those people ولا الضالين all those people who are like ضالين is, is basically it's a word used to describe a, a, a camel that lost its way in a desert like a camel who loses its owner and wanders in the desert what's going to happen to that camel with no food no drink that kind of camel is going to wander around till eventually it dies that's ضالين not astray. What does astray mean? Again, we don't want to, don't make me like those who are going to be the recipients of your rage. Those who outright just disobeyed your message in front of me. Someone was telling me, pray and fix my life and stop. But I just ended up just like rejecting the message in front of their face. I mean, or darling, like that stupid camel who just wandered around and eventually died and got misled. Like that person who just made up the religion as they went along. They never thought, let me ask, is this right? Let me ask, am I making a mistake? I mean... Then Allah responds, My slave, what you have asked me, I have given you. What you have asked me, I have given you. Brothers and sisters, that is the key to the prayer. The key. I just want to mention two very quick parts and then we're finished. When we go and we say Allahu Akbar again, if for any reason, may Allah forgive us. Of course, you, you can read a surah after the Fatiha. If we, for any reason, lost our concentration, remember, Allahu Akbar, you go into a ruku. Allah is greater than that thing that I'm thinking about. And what do you say? Subhana Rabbi al Azim. Subhan, you are perfect. You're per- There's nothing wrong with you. Subhan Rabb, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. You are a master that is perfect. There's no mistakes of you. No imperfections. You are perfect. Azim. And you are mighty. Adama. Like it comes from a bone. A bone is strong. You are Azim. You are perfect, our master. And you're strong. Notice that when you do that, you put yourself in the ruku. Ruku is the weakest position in the prayer. You know when you're bent over, like hands on your knees, leaning over like this, like this? That's the weakest position because that is when you have the least amount of balance. Even if a little kid comes over running and bumps into you, you are falling flat on your face. Brothers and sisters, notice the divine plan of Allah in this salah. That the point in which we make our body the weakest and most vulnerable in the salah is the point in which we say you are the strongest in the salah. Then we come up. سمع الله لمن حمده. Allah listens to the one who praises and thanks Him. Then we say ربنا ولك الحمد. We just said Allah listens to the one who praises and thanks Him. Then we say ربنا ولك الحمد. Our Master. And we, to you belongs the praise and the thanks. So what does that mean right now? 
Allah is already listening, but what does that mean? It means He's listening right now. Like, okay, you praise me. Like, okay, so, so what do you want? Again, if we lost our concentration, Allahu Akbar. And you go into sajda. And when you go into sajda, brothers and sisters, when you go into sajda, brothers and sisters, the prophet, some of the scholars explain that the entire prayer is like leading up to the sajda, and the sajda is like the grand finale of the prayer. It's the grand finale of the raka. It's, the, it's the, everything, the fatiha, the ruku, everything, the takbir was leading up to the sajda. Why? Because the sajda is when you are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said, if a man or a woman knew the rahmah, the mercy that surrounds the man and a woman when they are in sajda, they would not lift their head. Why are we so close to Allah in our sajda? What is the significance? Because we take the most honorable part of our bodies, the most honorable part of our creation, our head, our forehead, and we put it low, the lowest we possibly can. We take the most honorable, highest part of us and we put it low as we possibly can. And whilst our head is as low as it possibly can be, we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la. We put ourselves, though Allah, you are perfect. The one who is the most high. So earlier in Ruku, we put ourselves in the weakest position and said, you are the strongest. Now we put ourselves in the lowest position and say, you are the highest. SubhanAllah. And this is going through your brain while you're praying. Is your prayer not going to be alive? And then what happens next? Notice that some of the scholars made this reflection. They said, sometimes it's hard. See, the prayer is from the heart, not from the head, it's from the heart. Yeah? It's like when your iman, when your heart is strong, your prayer is strong, inshallah. Yeah? But every day, our head is above our heart. And our head, we use more than we use our heart. And our head gets a bit arrogant. And it's hard for the heart to become in tune and overpower the head. But notice that when you go into sajda, say your heart is here, and your heart is here, and your head is here. When you go into sajda, your head becomes lower than your heart. And now the heart is above the head. SubhanAllah. The vessel in which your iman is, the vessel in which the Prophet said that this, this, this organ, this, 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 this flesh in your body, if this is sound, the heart, everything is sound. Allah said, come. With qalbun salim, with a sound, beautiful heart, that f goes over the brain. Subhanallah. Stay in that position. Glorify Him. Humble yourself. Humiliate yourself. You are nothing in front of Him. Allah, we are nothing in front of Him. And we say, Subhanallah. Now, notice something. If I have a very close relationship with my friend and I ask him to give me something and I'm close to him, is he inclined to give me? He is, isn't he? If I'm far away from him and I ask him, he may not give me. So Allah gives and he gives and he gives and whenever you ask, he gives. But imagine asking him right now closest you can ever be to him ask him now what are you waiting for the salah is in Arabic but now you can say it in English you can, you can say it in Urdu Allah understands don't worry he understands ask him for whatever you want get personal have a conversation stay there for a while let your body relax. Let it feel. Then get up. Allahu Akbar. And repeat that until the prayer ends. And you tell me, after making the wudu, after detaching yourself mentally from the world and building a visual and attaching your heart to the prayer, positioning yourself, and then actually going through the prayer with this conversation with Allah and this engagement in the salah. Tell me, 
if you don't feel the fruits of the prayer. Down. And shaitan will come to you. And he will make it harder for you. The next few prayers will be good. But you need to come back to this video. And refresh your memory. Like everything I have explained to you. It needs to be habitual. It needs to be like habit. This is a video you're going to have to watch again and again. I'm sorry. You're going to have to watch it again and again. But you know what? Salah is the most important obligation that you have to fulfill after accepting Islam. There is nothing else important in your life other than this right now. So please watch this video again and again. And this is what will give you happiness. The kind that you will taste past death into the next life, inshallah. Barakallah fikum. And can I please request one thing? If you do take heed of what we shared in this video, when you go into that sajda that you do go into, I want you to make dua for me. When you're in that position. And I want you to make dua. You don't know him. But the brother's name is Gulad. He's one of the main brothers that runs this Nasiha session project. I want you to make dua for brother Ayan. He does all the media work. Brother Saad. He's my brother. And he works on the Nasiha session project. And brother Umar Isa. Because he happens to be in the room right now. We don't want him to feel left out. And he's a beautiful guy. Inshallah. And if you don't remember these names. It's okay. Just say, Ya Allah, please forgive and guide and grant Jannah to the brothers who work on the Nasiha session team. Just please don't forget that. And do that as much as you can. In that sajda, yeah? Barakallah feekum. May Allah bless you all. Keep your Nasiha request coming to Nasiha session at gmail.com. Share this video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace.